rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. That's how the world saw Paul and the Corinthians and the other communities gathered around as imposters, as dying, as unknown, as sorrowful, as having nothing. Paul knew a different truth. You know a different truth. The community I serve, we know a different truth. One of the things that I see in common between the community I serve and your community and the pastors that Reverend Hagler and I work with out in the broader community, one thing I see in common is the way that we talk about people. Now, out in the world, people are treated as mm, disposable, not important, not all people, right? But some people, as though they do not matter at all. And our communities know a different truth. We know, we might say, that every person is created in the image of God. We know, we might say, that every person is worthy. Ethical Culture, the movement that I serve, was founded by a man named Felix Adler. He had been studying, actually, to become a rabbi. And you know what happens. They do say sometimes you go to seminary and you lose your faith there. I don't know if you've heard that. Well, he went to study to be a rabbi and decided that wasn't the path for him. Instead, he started this new movement. He would be happy to see us together, I think, tonight. Because he started a movement that he said was to bring people together who might believe differently, but wanted to act as one for justice in the world. That was the dream that he held. And so he brought people together with all kinds of different beliefs. He said, this is a platform broad enough for worshiper and infidel. Now, this is the 19th century, all right? It was a bit, still a big deal to say that this is a platform broad enough for worshiper and infidel. There are not many places where you can say, Yes, you are all welcome here. And so he he started that message and he began this movement. And at the core of the movement was that idea that every person is worthy. Now, I like to read his work, um, and I like to read what what he says, particularly about people being worthy, because he doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't say, you know, oh, it's just easy. You look around, and everybody is worthy, and you just know it right by looking at them, right? Actually, he has a whole passage where he talks about all the ways that people don't seem particularly worthy when they do terrible things, or they make mistakes, or even, he goes on to say, when they uh, don't have sparkling, winning personalities, right? I mean, I don't know about you, perhaps it is different here, but, you know, not every single person I meet do I say, oh, I'd like to be their friend. (laughs) Every once in a while, there's someone where I have to work just a little bit harder to see their worth. And yet, he says, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the mistakes that they've made. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't matter what they've done, whether they've done amazing things or whether they are struggling to get by. It doesn't even matter if you like them, he says. They are worthy just because they are a person. Just because they are human, they are worthy. And it is our job, he says, to affirm that worth, whether we see it there or not. To see not with the eyes of the world, but with the eyes of faith. I tell my folks, you know, some of my folks come into the congregation not sure about being in a congregation at all. They'll say to me, I am not religious in the least. And I'll say, okay, well, I'll see you Sunday morning, though. (laughs) Okay, you can tell yourself that. That's fine. I say this is our faith statement. These are the eyes of faith that we see with that every person is worthy. Because the world tells us all the time that that isn't so. The world tells us all the time that not everybody is worthy, only some. 
or it tells us that our worth has to do with how much we earn or with what we do or with how productive we are. How much did you get done in a day? Sometimes, in fact, the world calculates our value down to the cent. Have you ever taken out a life insurance policy? Someone's there with a calculator. What is your value down to the cent? I was talking today with some folks in my congregation about lawsuit settlements about pricing a human's value, a human's life. Sometimes we get caught in that, in what the world tells us about what we are worth. Sometimes even I get caught in it. I I work and I have two children and I feel as though I'm always running in a million directions. And I get caught in that idea that my worth, my value, comes from how much of my to-do list I finish in a day. How many little boxes have I checked off? Did I answer all of the emails? Did I remember to call my mother? Did I pick the girls up at the right time? I will say I am surprised supposed to get them from school. That is a checklist on to-do that you really do have to mark off every single day. But the rest of it, the rest of it is more about how the world sees my worth. And we know something different. The Rabbi Elliot Kukla wrote um, a reflection in the New York Times several years ago that has stayed with me ever since I read it. He was a a rabbi serving a congregation, so of course I related to that, busy all the time, trying to get everything done and be everything to all people. And he got sick. He got sick, and at first he thought that he would be able to go and get better. You know, you get sick, and you go to the doctor, and the doctor gives you medicine, and then you'll be fine in a week or two and get right back to your to-do list. Well, he got sick, and he stayed sick. He had a chronic illness that was not going to go away. His body was going to be different for the rest of his life. And he found in that sickness, in that change in how much he could do, he found a whole new way of understanding his worth. He wrote, I had once measured my worth by my capacity to produce things and experiences, to be productive at work, to share responsibilities at home, to show up in my friendships and rack up achievements. Being sick, he wrote, has been a long, slow detox from capitalist culture and its mandate that we never rest. I found a deeper value in relationship beyond reciprocity an unconditional love and care based in justice, and a belief that all humans deserve relationship, regardless of whether we can offer anything measurable back. He saw his worth with the eyes of faith. He saw his worth not as the world saw it, not as the world told him it should be, not based on his net worth, but on the worth within, just because he was a person, just based on the love and care every single one of us deserves. No matter whether this is a week that we can return that love and care double, or a week when we can only receive it, a year when we can only receive it, a lifetime when we can only receive it, we remain worthy of that love and care just by being us. Those are the eyes of faith. The eyes of faith that help us to see beyond what the world tells us, beyond the hierarchies that the world sets up, beyond the patriarchies the world sets up, beyond the white supremacy structures the world sets up, beyond all those divisions that the world says are between us, to see the world with the eyes of 
Faith means that we see the true worth, the true value in each of us. We are treated as imposters and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see, we are alive. Oh, yeah. As having nothing and yet possessing everything. Now, I read that part of the scripture several times as having nothing and yet possessing everything. And I thought, how can that be? How can it be that you have nothing, that the world looks at you and you have nothing, and yet you know you possess it all? That you possess, in fact, so much that you can give it away, freely share it with everyone around you, that love and care that each of us deserve, that you possess it so greatly that you just throw it out like the seeds of a sower. How can that paradox be true? The world sees one thing and we know another. We are seen as having nothing and yet we possess everything. Lent, it seems to me, is a time of paradox. A time when we are asked to give up so that we might have more, right? To give up something that we perhaps held too closely so that we might have room in our hearts, in our lives, for more. I think about the Christian practice of kenosis, or self-emptying. Kenosis practiced by Jesus in giving up part of his divine nature to become human. A great self-emptying, giving up so that he could be more with us, right? To give most generously. And kenosis, as practiced by people now, a practice we are invited into To empty ourselves so that we might become more. To have nothing so that we might possess everything. There is a teaching from Taoism, the Eastern tradition, that I think speaks to this. And and there's a little story that I've heard and would like to share with you. It talks about a student, and aren't we all students, a student who was known everywhere for how clever he was. I can relate to this. I can think especially of myself in middle school. I don't know if any of you have read the Harry Potter books or seen the Harry Potter movies. You know Hermione, that little girl, right? And you love her by the end, but boy, in the beginning of that series, doesn't she just drive you a little bit bonkers? She knows every answer and raises her hand first. That was me. That was just imagine me in fifth grade, hands up, up, I know, I know. So here's this student, known everywhere for how smart he was. He always had the right answer. And so he goes to visit a Tao master at his very humble home. Very simple. And he goes so that he can learn yet one more thing to add to his impressive store of knowledge. Remember, he already has all of the answers, but perhaps this Tao master can teach him just one more thing. And so he sits down, and the Tao master offers him a cup of tea, as he does everyone who comes into his home. You all know about that practice of hospitality. I could feel it this evening. When someone comes into your home, you give generously of what you have. And so the master offers him a cup of tea. And while he is pouring the tea, the student, that clever student, starts talking about the Tao, the way. 
And of course, remember, he knows all the answers. And so as the master is pouring the tea, he just goes on and on and on about Tao and the way and all that he knows and all that he's studied and all that he's bringing to this conversation. And the master just keeps pouring the tea until the cup begins to overflow. And finally, the student cannot ignore it anymore. Tea is spilling on the table and practically dripping down onto the floor. And he says, stop, stop, it's over full. You, you, you've done it wrong. No more tea will go into the cup. Stop pouring, master. And the master says, you are like this cup. How can I show you the Tao? How can I show you the way unless you first empty your cup? (laughs) Unless you first empty your cup. There is no room for more tea in some of our lives. (laughs) We need to empty the cup so that more can come in. We need to have nothing so that we can possess everything. That, I think, is what we are invited to do during Lent. It is what we are invited to do every time we walk through the doors of our congregations. It is what we are invited to do every time we look in another person's eyes. And we choose to see them with the eyes of faith instead of with the eyes of the world. We are invited to empty our cup so that love can come in. The world sees us one way, every single one of us. And we can choose to let that be the final word on us. Hmm. Or we can choose different. You know, I know, what the eyes of faith can see if we are only empty enough to let them. That is my prayer for you. It is my prayer for me with my hand in the air that I put it down and empty the cup and see with the eyes of faith every person worthy, complete, perfect, having nothing and possessing everything. Amen. That's a bold, beautiful, wonderful word. And it's a very fitting way that we end this Lenten series. And I want to just thank uh, Reverend Amanda Poppy for just coming here and allowing the Spirit to use her. To use her to open up categories and to exegete that scripture in some fresh new ways. Bringing fresh new eyes to it to break it open in some fresh new ways. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Bonnie, you going to do something? Y'all got something in mind?
Amen. What a wonderful and beautiful and rich evening. And I want to just lift up a few announcements as we proceed forward. One is to spread the word, please, that on Easter we have one service. Easter we'll have one service at 10 a.m. Uh, if you could spread that word and let folk know that we have one service, 10 a.m. on Easter. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, work your, your email and work your telephone and work your uh, whatever else you use, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, right? Uh, to work it, amen? Uh, it's one service, Easter, 10 a.m. Also, uh, on next Thursday is what? What's the next Thursday? Monday. Monday, Thursday. Okay. All right. We're going to have service, 7 p.m. Amen. And it's going to be a joint service Amen. of Plymouth, New Hope, Baptist, United Church of Christ, Amen. and Empowerment Libera- Liberation Cathedral. Amen. So we're going to all come together in one service next Thursday night. All right. Our Monday, Thursday service. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the fact is, is that we, we, we're under the same roof, Amen. and there's some things we can do together, Amen. and this is one of them. And so uh, it's a matter of us uh, coming and just helping to lift up the occasion, right, uh, and to uh, be able to celebrate. And uh, you got any news around that, Reverend King, for us? Oh, we're in the process of preparing right now. Hey, y'all heard, right? Y'all heard. <laughs> Y'all, y'all, y'all heard, so don't let Reverend King down, please. All right, so come and be a part of it. Huh? What was that? <laughs> 7 p.m. All right, the, the covenant together, it works together, y'all. Right? Because, uh, you know, y'all say, well, we've been coming out every Thursday. I think I'm going to take this Thursday off. No, don't do that on this coming Thursday. It gets us prepared to go into, into uh, as we go through Holy Week. Yeah. Right? So come and be prepared and blessed. And what is Sunday? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday, right? All right. Palm Sunday this Sunday. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Again. Hmm? And Communion Sunday. Thank you, Deacon Taylor. <laughs> Let me not forget. I'm going to ask if we can stand and Reverend Julianne Robinson will come and lift up our benediction. Good Friday will take place at Peoples. 12 noon at Peoples. We've been doing that for at least... 27 years. <laughs> so as we prepare to return this evening, we hold the spirit of faith in our hearts. We allow ourselves to see each other as whole, perfect, and complete, just as we are. Yeah. Let us pray. Father God, we come to you in deep gratitude, rejoicing in the message that was delivered so brilliantly by our sister this evening. Lord, we ask that she be anointed and blessed and protected, and that she and her family have traveling mercies as they go to Ireland. Lord God, we conclude this ceremony, we conclude this evening, with a word of thanks, asking that each of us be escorted by the Holy Spirit safely to our home. Yes, These are the things that we pray. Amen. Amen.
Yeah.